Hello everyone and welcome to a classroom arrangement styles a, a presentation. Okay, I'm going to quickly open this up to full screen. And uh, before again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, remember, we are a family of educators. Together we make a family of educators. And let's, uh, you know, continue to with this uh, professional development and um, we'll start right to it. So uh, there's a video that I have. Uh, it's a, a a whiteboard animation video that uh, also covers this. I'll put a link in the description as well. And many of these images that you'll see are, are from those uh, from those videos. Uh, so here we go. Uh, classroom arrangement styles. Now there are a number of different classroom arrangement styles available to educators. Uh, however, the most common one is uh, this style right here, as you can see. This is the traditional arrangement style. And you can see it's all just rows of desks, just rows of desks, rows of desks, rows of desks. This is the traditional model. It's the most common one. But this might not always be, this style might not always be the most, uh, uh, this might not be the best uh, arrangement style for a particular lesson. So there's all these different cool arrangement styles that we're going to go over. Now, it's, it's funny, too, here, because if you want to know why these, uh, why teachers use this particular arrangement style, it's because uh, it's easiest for the janitors to sweep and things like that. So it's not even, you know, it, it just got passed down from one to the next to the next, and it, it just became the traditional model. So uh, this model is good for keeping students on task. It's great for giving exams because teachers can easily supervise. But this is not a student-centered uh, model, and it oft often leads to boredom here. So what I like about the traditional one, and I will use it whenever I'm giving a test, because you need to have students spaced out whenever you're giving an exam or something like that. So if you're giving, an, especially a standardized test, right? A standardized test has to have the traditional model, where students are uh, behind one another, and you know it's you know they can't see through it. You know you can't see you know over the person in front of you, and they just want to space it out. Okay. And the teacher's desk is usually in the front, and here's like your whiteboard. So this is the tr this is the traditional model, and again, it's the most popular of all seating arrangements, and it's used to create space. Now, uh, this uh, with what's going on now <laughs> nowadays with the pandemic, this is probably going to be uh, you know used more and more. Uh, school personnel and guests will usually see this arrangement from kindergarten through college levels, and in college and, and in college and university they almost always have this. There's not much group work and, and changing of arrangement styles in, in higher education. So the teacher's desk is located in front of the room, usually in the corner, okay, in the traditional arrangement here. Sorry. Usually in the corner and near the, and, and near the whiteboard or the blackboard. The desk are arranged in simple rows and columns and students are facing the teacher and the whiteboard. Almost any type of a standardized testing situation will use the traditional arrangement. Teachers can move up and down the row, uh, move up and down the rows, and they're able to to help students individually. Students are able to work independently. This is good for independent work. Um, it's not suited for group work, obviously. And uh, students in the front of the room actually have an advantage over students in the back of the room. So uh, that's one of the one of the downfalls of a traditional arrangement. Uh, if you want, you know, use this arrangement when giving your students exams or, or, or other types of assessments. Teachers can keep an eye on all the students and quickly spot off-task behavior. Uh, if you're in the front of the room, it's easy to, to, to see who's doing what and things like that. This is good if you really want to observe what's going on. Uh, teachers mostly use direct instruction with this arrangement. And uh, this is a, a for, sort of a, a form of passive learning. Uh, when you're using the traditional arrangement, students are, are sort of just taking in content, but they're not really creating, right? This is a, a teacher-directed uh, lesson. Uh, this is for teacher-directed lessons, not student-centered. All right, so that was the traditional arrangement. Next, we have uh, the horseshoe arrangement, uh, something that, that I remember when I was a kid in school. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, this is good for discussion forums. Uh, students can take center stage. You can see this middle here. Uh, teachers can easily get to their students. It's hard um, in the traditional arrangement uh, to get through these desks because they're usually like right on top of one another. So the teacher can't really get through. So they have to go all the way here and get here. And Whereas with this one, uh, I'm sorry. With this one, you can see the teacher can easily get to this student and move around. Uh, the space can be used for kinesthetic activities, uh, but students often uh, copy their, their 
often copy each other's work when they're like right next to each other. So uh, younger grade teachers take advantage of the open space. They use it for activities uh, to get the student's attention. They can, you know, get really close to a student. Uh, students, uh, uh, they can also, again, this is for younger, uh, younger grades, they can get students moving in the middle of the room, some fun activities. And, and you know, I remember using this arrangement too where we would uh, color in the bones. There'd be like a big giant poster and we'd all get down there. We'd color in the bones and have to match them up. You know, know the tibia, the fibia is a lot of fun. Uh, students can easily share materials with one another. Uh, students can help each other too. So if you want to seat, you know, a, a student that's struggling next to a student that knows a lot of, uh, that's very, uh, very high performing, you can do that and have them help each other out. The downfall with this one is it leads to copying of others' works. And even though we say that they can share materials, uh, they also steal from one another too, or take and, you know. So in the horseshoe arrangement, students are arranged in this U shape, okay? Hence the name, and uh, facing towards one another. Uh, this is a little variation of, of the horseshoe arrangement where you have uh, uh, desks in the middle here as well. So it's like a horseshoe with another horseshoe in the middle. Uh, when you use this variation, the problem is you lose that, that middle space. But it's easy for the, you know, the teacher kind of moves in a horseshoe as well. Um, the teacher can stand in the middle of the room and become the main point of attention. Okay, that's not for the variation, but, you know, for this one here, this, all eyes are, are easily on the teacher. Uh, the variation includes the middle, it has like a U shape now, like I said, for this variation. So, what else do we know about this horseshoe arrangement? Uh, teachers can sort of bounce, bounce around the room and they can get to any student and help them with work. Uh, the arrangement is more suited for discussions as opposed to the traditional model. Open space is a great is a great place for presenters to take stage and engage with the audience. So if your students are, if you have presentations, you want to put your student here and they can sort of present and, and walk around and, and, you know, show activities and show their work. So it's good for taking center stage. Um, this is just another video on classroom discussions. Okay, uh, small groups. Uh, all right, so great for building teamwork, student discussions, and doing projects. But, you know, these small groups, it also gets a little loud, and whenever you group students, not all students contribute. Uh, the th this is the third seating arrangement. All right, so uh, sometimes they call it group pods. And small groups doesn't have to be groups of four. It could be three, five, six. Um, here the teacher's desk is located in front of the room, and the desks are usually situated in groups of four, but like I said, larger variations are possible. Using small groups will create space in the classroom. The arrangement is great for projects. So you want to use this small group arrangement for projects, hands-on activities, cooperative learning. Cooperative learning, uh, students can discuss project plans and still work together as a functioning unit and develop uh, teamwork skills. As the students are working on their projects, the teachers can walk the room and facilitate learning. So you can see here as well, that there's a little bit more movement for the teacher. It's not as restrictive as the, the traditional. And this is just a, a little background on co cooperative learning. Now, a small groups arrangement. Uh, we're, we're, we're still on this here, right? So, so some of the downsides. The downside include the room getting a little too loud. Uh, with any group work, there's usually one person that doesn't put their fair share of effort, and that can lead to a lot of problems. And just like with other with other seating arrangement, uh, changing seats may be necessary at times. So every once in a while, you're gonna have to switch up groups, and you're gonna get problems. All right, this is called the runway. The runway is great for political debates. Uh, students can bounce ideas off each other. Uh, however, it can get loud as well. And students on the ends of the rows feel isolated. So if the teacher is like here in the middle, here's the teacher's desk. You can feel a little isolated down here if you're at the end. And you don't have somebody, you know, somebody behind you. Uh, the runway, uh, the teacher's desk is in a corner and students are facing one another. It creates a nice large space in the middle like a runway for models. Now, depending on the size of the class, you could have two rows on each side. Large movable whiteboards and blackboards are sometimes placed in the runway. So sometimes a teacher could place a nice, uh, a nice uh, whiteboard here and, and, you know, move it up and down. Large move. Okay. Uh, teachers will stand in the middle and bounce back and forth from student to student. The runway is most often used when teachers are setting up a classroom debate. Okay, think about it. You're going to have two sides kind of arguing, going back and forth. 
Each side of the runway will have their own argument and present it to each other. Other times, teachers can use the open space to perform demonstrations for students. The arrangement may lead to shouting across the room. Uh, this arrangement is also good if you have like uh, if you're playing games and stuff like that. Okay, paired groups. All right, this is excellent for peer tutoring, uh, uh, where gifted students can uh, pair with struggling students. Okay, uh, paired groups, or you could call it a peer tutoring. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to be very judicious in uh, in um, grouping students together. So it works well for lab partners if tables are not available. So if you know you don't have a lab table, you can put the two of them together, and it does create space as well. We said a lot of these different arrangements create space that you don't get in the traditional model. So the paired groups, uh, although there's many different names, uh, you may, you know, you may hear it. Dyads is another one. Paired pods, paired grouping, but it's really just pairs. We could call it. So the teacher's desk is located in the corner or the front of the room, and the desks are arranged in groups of two, and they're facing the front of the classroom here. So here's the teacher's desk, and here you've got these, these pairs. Now, uh, when it comes to assigning student pairs, there are different ways teachers can go. Uh, for example, uh, you can pair high and low students together, or you may want to pair low students together and high students together. So if you have the high and low students, it's called heterogeneous pairing. You have a, a high-performing student, a low-performing student. That's more like peer tutoring. And if you want to go homogenous, where you have both, maybe both students are, are low or, or both students are high, you can use that to differentiate instruction. Where you give us assignments, you know, to the to the uh, what is it? To the low-performing students will be the same assignment, and they can work together. Now, uh, teachers have some teachers have some space to get to their students quickly. It's not as open. But uh, they can still move. The teacher's movement isn't as hindered as the traditional, but it's not as free as small groupings in this paired group. Uh, peer tutoring is the most obvious reason to utilize this seating arrangement. I'm very big on peer tutoring. Um, with respect to peer tutoring, though, be sure that each student understands their role and responsibilities as a peer tutor in 2D. Um, you have to know which, you know, know which ones the, which ones, sort of uh, given the instruction and which ones learning. But you have to be careful, too, because you, you don't want one student to be perceived as being smarter than the other. Uh, one other reason for this pair grouping is the, think, the famous think-pair-share uh, assignment. I use it. I've used it many times. I like it a lot. Some schools use this arrangement for lab partner groupings, a typical of a science classroom. And now we get to the round table. Very fun. Okay, this is best for creating inclusivity among students, facilitating communication of classroom discussions, and having introduction of, of members. However, it's limited to discussion activities, and uh, shy students feel exposed here because everybody, you know, everybody's a part of it. So the round table is kind of cool. So uh, here we go. The desks form a circle with an open space in the middle, and all desks are facing each other to increase face-to-face -face interaction. So the round table increases face-to-face -face interaction, and uh, teacher will usually take on uh, the teacher will usually take on of the students. Uh, I'm sorry, right here. This is a, a typo. Um, the round table is meant for equal sharing of power. So if you notice here, every Every student's kind of equal. That's why we say it's a very inclusive. Uh, it's it's a very inclusive seating arrangement, and teachers and students should not be in in the middle of the round table. It's not meant to put anybody in the middle here. You don't want to put anybody in the middle. Okay, you can't really get to the middle either. So everybody's equal. Sorry. I'm sorry. All right. A uh, one way to make use of the round table is for ice breaking activities. So this is very good in the beginning of the year if you want every student to introduce themselves. If you're gonna do an ice breaking activity, use the round table. Teachers first introduce themselves to the class and next the students have to introduce themselves to the class. And the best thing about the round table is that all students feel that they're part of the group. The runway is meant for arguing points whereas the round table is for harmonious discussion and relationship building, okay? So, Sorry. So that that's it. This this was a bit of a short one, but you know, I just, I just want to say we're always with the traditional traditional. You really should mix it up, and, and it'll be a lot of fun to have different types of uh, to have different types of seating arrangement, and the kids really enjoy it, and it adds some novelty to the room, and it just makes it a, it just makes it more fun of an experience. 
So I want to say thanks again, and I'll see you soon for the uh, for our next professional development uh, for our next prof uh, for our next professional development day.